Welcome to the Nutrition Diva Podcast, a show where we take a closer look at health headlines, nutrition news, and trends so that you can make more informed choices about what you eat. I'm your host, Monica Reinagel, and I have a special guest today. Registered dietitian nutritionist Melissa Yeager is here with me. She is the head of nutrition for My Fitness Pal. Welcome to the podcast, Melissa. Thank you so much for having me. Now, most people will be familiar with My Fitness Pal as a food logging app mm-hmm. and may not be aware of the fact that there is a whole team of registered dietitians on staff creating content designing programs and features for users, and even conducting research into things like nutrition literacy and the role of social media and influencers in this whole nutrition conversation. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. Yes. I'm so excited to share more because I think you're right. Consumers are aware that MyFitnessPal has been around actually since 2005. And so in that scope, you know, we have this ability to reach a global population and we in fact are the number one global nutrition and food tracking app, but there's so much that goes on behind the scenes to ensure the scientific credibility and accuracy of the information that we're sharing with our MyFitnessPal members and the general public. And there's a lot of work for us to do here, isn't there? Last year, one of the projects that MyFitnessPal spearheaded was a a survey where you were quizzing the general population on their nutrition IQ. And before we get into what your survey results revealed, I want to give my listeners a chance to test their own nutrition IQ because I actually think they will do very well. So here are just two of the questions that you featured on your survey. So hold back the answer, Melissa. Give them a chance to think about it. The first question is, how many grams of protein does a banana have? And this is a multiple choice question. Your choices are zero grams of protein and a banana, one gram of protein, five grams of protein, or 10 grams of protein in a banana. Okay, listeners, what's your, I won't sing you the Jeopardy theme, but (laughs) Select your answer before we reveal. And now, Melissa, tell us first what most people answered for this question. The average answer was 10 grams. 10 grams of protein in a banana. And now, what is the correct answer, which I'm sure that most of my listeners actually guessed? What is the correct amount of protein in a banana? One gram. So we were off by a factor of 10 to 1. People are seriously overestimating the amount of protein in their bananas. And what's kind of funny is that bananas are actually the number one most logged food in the MyFitnessPal app. Okay, then you would think they would be paying attention to these (laughs) kinds of details. All right, one more before we move to the larger picture here. Okay, listeners, which of these four foods has more calories, contains more calories? A cheeseburger? A small bag of plain potato chips, fish tacos, or Caesar salad. Now, I have to admit, I might have gotten this one wrong if I had been taking this survey, probably because I would have thought you were trying to trick us somehow, and I might have guessed the Caesar salad. But first, tell us what most people thought had the most calories, and the choices again were cheeseburger, small bag of potato chips, fish tacos, or Caesar salad? Most people said? Cheeseburger. Okay. I, that's reasonable. I can see that being totally reasonable. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So what was the correct answer here? So the correct answer was fish tacos. And I will caveat by saying they were shown images of the food okay. and the fish tacos themselves, the fish was fried. It wasn't baked or grilled. And so that is what I think tripped up a lot of consumers because- One, we're very familiar with cheeseburgers. You know, we associate it with being a little bit more indulgent. And people were probably thinking, you know, hey, fish, leaner, Mm -hmm. all of those things that we hear all of the time. But in reality, you know, trying to to really discern what those graphics were telling us, I think, led to maybe some of the, the confusion on this one. Well, and of course, that's important that you were showing images so that there were some cues about portion size. This is another thing that we 
often struggle with is correctly estimating those portion sizes. But yeah, I often will open up a menu and look for fish tacos as one of my healthier options. But of course, I do then read that description to find out, is this fish going to be fried? In which case, maybe not, unless I'm really in the mood for a fish fry. So where are folks getting their nutrition information? According to your research, people are three times more likely to be getting their nutrition information and advice from TikTok or other social media platforms than from a nutrition professional. Yes, I think this is such a staggering statistic. So in the fall of 2023, MyFitnessPal ended up surveying over 2,000 people, general population across the United States, Canada, Australia, and the UK. So again, getting some of that global perspective into this survey, and we specifically looked at the population of millennials and Gen Z, which we know are very active social media users. Uh, And we... that. That fact of 61% of respondents actually looking to social media for health and wellness information and with the top platform being TikTok Mm -hmm. was staggering to myself, just the popularity and the usage of that for finding nutrition information. But we also have to think critically about the accuracy of that information. 100%. Now, MyFitnessPal has a very robust presence on TikTok, Mm -hmm. um, thankfully. But it seems like pushing back or countering these sort of unscientific claims and trends is becoming a bit of a full-time job for you because a lot of the nutrition information and advice that you're seeing that people are finding on TikTok is, to put it mildly, questionable. So, for example, what is the deal with lettuce water? (laughs) So lettuce water... This was simply the practice of steeping lettuce in hot water, similar to trying to make some type of tea. Uh, The claims that were coming out about this one were surrounding how lettuce water could improve sleep. And what we know from scientific research is that there's not that credible level of research yet to support that components of lettuce when steeped in water are going to improve your sleep. There was a study done back in 2017 that looked at rodents who they gave different extracts of lettuce to, but they were also taking certain drugs Mm. to help with sleep. So again, no credible linkage there, but trying to discern if maybe that's where this idea or concept first originated. However, I would much rather eat my lettuce in a salad, wouldn't you? Same, same. (laughs) And it's interesting, so often with these claims that seem so outlandish, there is actually a small kernel of truth that then gets spun wildly out of control. But sometimes that's enough to give it the appearance of legitimacy. If somebody's citing a study, sometimes we don't do what my fitness pal did, which is to go read that study and find out what it actually did and didn't say. Another trend that I just saw yesterday on TikTok is something they're calling rice zempic, which it seems to be just sort of a recycled version of an earlier trend from a few months ago, oat zempic. These are soaking rice in water or soaking oats in water. And then the claim that this could be a natural and inexpensive alternative to Ozempic or other weight loss or obesity medications. What did you find there? Exactly. So with Ozempic, they were taking and blending the oats with water and adding a little bit of lime juice and maybe a dash of cinnamon to flavor it. But in my head, when I combine those ingredients, that that taste just doesn't sound appealing to me. Um, However, they were, you know, saying and claiming that it really supported their weight loss journey and obviously was much less expensive than the medication. However, we have to remember that these Nutrition fads and trends are not a replacement for medication and for somebody who is utilizing medication to support their health and wellness, medical conditions, whatever it may be. So at the end of the day, drinking a starchier water or liquid, um, while it may you know allow you to hydrate a little bit more, you're consuming some fluid, some water there, you're not necessarily reaping the full benefits of eating foods in whole form, following a balanced diet. Um, 
getting things that taste better into your diet that you enjoy eating. I want food to be something that's enjoyable for consumers mm -hmm. and not feel like it's a chore or something that they don't want to consume or that it doesn't taste good to them. So I think we have to really navigate, you know, would you rather eat your oats and rice as part of a meal or in a mixed dish versus drinking them? And you can just focus on drinking water. That may be kind of one of those discerning steps to say, is this trend really worth it for me or can I take a different approach? Well, and when we talk about this, these claims, of course, they sound a little ridiculous when we unpack them here on a nutrition podcast. But I just want to say, when you are scrolling through one of these social media feeds and you come across a very charismatic, very emphatic influencer who's talking about amazing results that they themselves have experienced, I can see how people get a little caught up in this, especially if there's a desire to believe that there really is an easier way or a faster way or a cheaper way to get these kinds of results. So I think we should remember that we all can be somewhat susceptible to this sort of wishful thinking and get caught up in enthusiasm. Um, they don't call them influencers for nothing, right? 100%. And I think that's one of the hardest parts of when you're trying to figure out what is fact versus what is fiction when you're navigating these claims, because we see it pop up again and again. It's coming from multiple sources. It's coming from different uh, yes. influencers. It is you know, being tied in to sound similar to the medication itself. Um, for some of these trends, specifically the Rysempic and Otsempic, um, it's something that, again, can be very easily, you know, misconstrued. And like you said, so many consumers are wanting to take steps to improve their health and well-being. And some of these solutions seem like a very easy step to take when you're starting that journey. And so that's part of, I think, one of the challenges of trying to discern what is going to work well for me. And also think about, you know, what else are these influencers doing to support their health and wellness simultaneously? They oftentimes don't talk about if they're working out, if they're, you know, changing their caloric intake or their caloric yeah. makeup, if they're working with a healthcare professional. So there's so many factors that impact our health and well-being that I think it's always important to take a step back when we see these really enticing trends and go, is this going to be the magic bullet or is it, you know, just one part or one thing that I could try or I, you know, am interested in, but maybe I can use this as a jumping pad to say, let's go learn more or let's figure out what other solutions are. Right. And I think you said something very important there. And that is that one of the ways that these things start to feel more plausible is when we see them over and over again from different sources, it starts to feel like, well, maybe there's something to this. This is the fourth or fifth time I've read this. And we need to remind ourselves that these social media channels are echo chambers where one unreliable source can be picked up and amplified by a whole bunch more well meaning, but ultimately, unreliable sources. And of course, yes, we don't always see what's happening off camera. Yes, 100%. So some of these TikTok trends that you have surfaced on the MyFitnessPal blog seem harmless enough, like adding balsamic vinegar to sparkling water, which some people think makes sort of something that tastes a little bit like a Coke, but without the sugar. Or there's a trend going around right now about eating raw carrot salads on a daily basis, which I mean, I have no objection to people eating more raw carrots. However, we we do need to temper our expectations for what sort of uh, benefits these little hacks are going to bring for our health. That's where we start to leave the realm of reality. Exactly. Like you said, carrots in and of themselves, great nutrients. I love when people are adding more vegetables to their diet. But some of the health claims that were touted with this were connected more to hormone balance and right. hormone levels. And so, again, some of these are tied back to more complex medical conditions rather than a one food or a one type of drink to support all of our health and wellness needs. Just this morning while we were preparing for this interview, I saw one about uh, TikTokers saying that if you rub raw garlic cloves on your acne, it will help improve the acne. And they interviewed a dermatologist saying, please, please don't do this. <laughs> this is not a good idea. It could actually make things worse. So there's obviously a gap here between the amount of information and advice that's being handed out here and the accuracy and the reliability of it. And although 
My Fitness Pal is certainly doing its part to increase the level of nutrition literacy on TikTok and elsewhere. Most of the people talking about nutrition on TikTok are not qualified professionals. And I was so interested to see you recently partnered with Dublin University to examine just how accurate is this information on TikTok in a much more quantitative way. Tell us what you found in that analysis. Yes. So as part of our preliminary findings, we partnered and analyzed over 67,000 videos on social media using AI to compare them to general public health and nutrition guidelines to see is something accurate, completely inaccurate? Is it hard to discern the accuracy level? And what we found in our those preliminary findings is that only about 2.1% of the analyzed content proved to be accurate when compared to those guidelines. 2%. One out of every 50 videos that you analyzed was actually presenting accurate information. Yes. And I think this is where, again, these social media platforms are free and easily accessible. And we know that oftentimes in the health and wellness and nutrition industry, it can feel very expensive or certain things can be cost prohibitive. So I understand why consumers are going to these social media platforms to find nutrition information. But when I hear that statistic that only 2% is accurate, it is startling, but I also see it as an opportunity for registered dietitians, credentialed health practitioners, to get on these platforms Mm -hmm. and continue to help to debunk and spread credible nutrition information to ensure that users have access to accurate scientific information to support their health and wellness. Yeah, it's a real call to arms to anyone who feels like they have the bandwidth in their professional portfolio to take on that kind of communication. It can make a real impact. So you have created a lot of resources to help your users boost their own nutrition literacy. You've got a guide to spotting questionable nutrition advice. We're going to put a link to these resources in our show notes for today's interview. And there is a wealth of resources and information online on the MyFitnessPal blog, which is at myfitnesspal.com. And of course, a lot of this is also available in the app, which people can find in the Google and app stores, I would venture to say nine out of 10 listeners already have it on their phone, even if they haven't opened it up recently. So there is much more information available through this app. There's more to do on my fitness pal than just track how many calories or protein our banana has in it. <laughs> yes, exactly. And I also wanted to ask you about your upcoming webinar series. Tell us what's going on there. This is one I'm really excited about to get started this fall. We are offering a series of five webinars free to join and take part in. Several of our webinars are going to focus specifically on how to help you use and navigate the app to best reach your health goals. So if you're somebody who hasn't yet downloaded the app and you're not quite sure where to get started and you're thinking, okay, this app with a database of 20.5 million foods, where do Mm -hmm. I go? How do I get started? We're here to help guide you along in that process and set those goals to really help you achieve the results that you're looking for while using the app. And then there's a series of three webinars that are hosted by myself and my fellow registered dietitian team to look at some of the, the key nutrition topics that we are seeing consumers asking more and more about and that have been trending throughout our blog. One of those is going to be honing in on better understanding macros and macros 101. So hopefully that would help improve some of that nutrition IQ score we were seeing, Mm -hmm. um, identifying some of the common sources of carbs, protein, fat, how to incorporate in your diet to create balance. We also know that consumers are really seeking information about meal planning and prepping. So we're going to be doing a webinar that's going to touch on how to meal plan and prep with your budget in mind, because we want to make sure that consumers feel like it's achievable for them at any budget, at any family size. And then we're going to round things out with a final webinar on debunking some of the common nutrition myths that we see across the board. So I think that will be a very fun one for users to engage with and and hopefully help to shift how they think and approach some of these different larger scale myths that we've heard over the years, and then how to identify some of the the trends and whether or not they're they're valid to support their health. 
okay, Melissa, I got to tell you, I've been doing that for 15 years. So good luck taking care of that (laughs) in a 45 minute webinar. But we will have links that um, will allow people to register for these free webinars again in our show notes. Thank you so much for joining me today, Melissa. And I really appreciate what you all are doing to contribute in a positive way to nutrition literacy in the online sphere. Thank you so much for having me. And I sincerely appreciate that you've allowed my fitness pal to step into your podcast and share our resources with consumers because I hope that they bring value and help individuals across the globe. And I will also look forward to connecting with you and the rest of the MyFitPal nutrition team at the Food and Nutrition Conference happening this fall in Minneapolis. So for my listeners who are themselves nutrition professionals and would like to engage with the work that MyFitnessPal is doing on digital nutrition literacy, I want to encourage you all to stop by their booth in the expo hall if you're going to be at Fenty and mention that you heard this episode. Yes, please come out and join us at the Fancy Expo this fall. We are booth 1516, and I hope to see you there. Nutrition Diva is a quick and dirty tips podcast. Our team includes Brandon Getches, Nathan Sems, Davina Tomlin, Holly Hutchings, and Morgan Christensen. That's all for this episode. Thanks so much for listening. I'll see you next week.